Yeah, get it on. Got to get on. The choice we get on mandate. Get it on. Thanks for tuning in. Thanks for telling a friend. I'm very excited about speaking to Vivek Ramaswamy, who I've been watching and taking note of over the last several months. So uh, good to see you, my friend. It's good to be on, man. How are you? I'm well. And uh, congratulations on, if anything, just stirring the pot. Just bring in some energy, bring in some youth, bring in some ideas, and just mixing it up. Well, we're hoping to do more than that, but uh, but thank you for that. I appreciate it. Well, you know, I heard about some of your ideas, you know, several, quite a few months ago. I'm not a Johnny Come Lately. I've talked to Dr. Drew about you, and, and I'm like, I love this guy because he's smart, and there's something going on governmentally that I've been discussing. I mean, I live in California, so I'm surrounded by all these sort of 10 cent heads. And I, at this point, don't care what side of the aisle you you're on. I just want a sort of intellect that seems to be missing. I appreciate you saying that. I think that I don't talk much about Republicans and Democrats for a reason. I think these labels are reductionist. They force people to think in terms of talking points and slogans they memorized instead of independently asking the question of how do we revive the essence of the greatest nation known to man on principle? And so I try to think from first principles. I'm not a party man. I'm using the Republican Party as a vehicle to advance a pro-American, America first agenda. And I think that that means I don't say everything in the same way a standard politician is taught to say them. I, I think whatever that binder is of a Republican politician supposed to get about how you're supposed to discuss every issue by issue. I didn't get the binder, nor do I want it. But I think that that gets me, uh, you know, into short term trouble sometimes. And that's OK, where I'll be misquoted or or misportrayed by mainstream press. But the good news is we have modern media that sidesteps much of that traditional media as well. And we're able to actually speak truth such that hopefully by the end of this race, everybody knows who I am and what I stand for. And I think that's going to be the successful electoral strategy. But if after everybody knows who I am and what I stand for, if they want to go with somebody else, that's their choice. And I'm perfectly comfortable with that as well. Well, I'm interested in how your race has factored into this, if at all, because what I know from watching legacy media is race is everything if you're a Democrat, but if you're a Republican, it's neither here nor there, or maybe you're an Uncle Tom or a sellout, or as they, the uh, Los Angeles Times called Larry Elder, the blackface of white supremacy. So they will applaud your race if you're on the left, but if you're on the right, they'll either leave it alone or or attack it. Um, but for you, I've never heard it come up. Mm -hmm. It's interesting. Yeah, I, I don't, I'm not sure why. I mean, I guess I don't lean into it that much. I don't lean out of it. I don't lean into it. My parents were immigrants to this country. That is relevant to some of the struggles we went through growing up economically and otherwise from parents who actually had to work their way up in this country. I, I guess I am so over the racial division and race baiting of seeing each other on the basis of the color of their skin. You know, even other Republican candidates, I think, lean into it maybe a little bit more than I do. And so that that lends itself to making it more of a topic of conversation. I mean, the fact of the matter is, I think that have I experienced racism in my life? Yes, I have. But have I also stubbed my toe? Yes, I have. And I didn't let either one ruin my life over it. And I think that that's something, a spirit that we would all do well, I think, to embrace in this country. The moment we live in, we're as close to the promised land as we've ever been. I don't think racism ranks as a top 50 concern in the United States of America. And so, you know, with time being scarce, we might as well spend our time talking about top 50 concerns or top five concerns rather than something that really is withering its way down to irrelevance. I agree, but it reminds me of a clip that I watch periodically just so I can amuse myself, which was during the Biden Trump debate, um, Trump brought up Russia and uh, Joe Biden. He brought up China, I think, and Joe Biden being corrupt, which is uh, it's pretty evident now that it that it was. But this is October 2020. But the part that I found found interesting about it because it was just Biden and Trump arguing and Biden calling all that Russian collusion. It was the moderator 
in the debate saying we need to get back to talking about race. Mm -hmm. That's the part that's that stood out. And I'll play the clip. It's only three years old, but it's it's pretty amusing. Well, I tell you what, I uh, I hope he does look at me because what's happening here is, you know who I am. You know who he is. You know his character. You know my character. You know our reputations for honor and telling the truth. I am anxious to have this race. I am anxious to see this take place. I am the character of the country is on the ballot. Our character is on the ballot. Look at us closely. Let me ask some follow me. Please respond. If and then we're going to have follow up. This is true questions. about Russia, Ukraine, China, other countries, Iraq. If this is true, then he's a corrupt politician. Right. So don't give me the stuff about how you're this innocent baby. Joe, they're calling you a corrupt politician. Nobody. Hey, President Trump, the laptop I want to stay hell. on the issue Excuse of race. Me. We're Take talking about the, the issue. laptop from hell. Yeah, I think we even have her one more time jumping in. We want to talk about the issue of race. Of course you do, because it's a deflection from everything you don't want to talk about. That's actually what this is. Yeah, well, we got one more quickie. I'll play it. Yeah. I mean, the laptop is now yeah. another Russia, Russia, Russia hoax. And you that's exactly be. what is this that's where exactly you're going? what this is going. where he's going. The that, laptop right. is Russia, yeah. Russia, Gentlemen, Russia. I want to stay on the issue of race. You okay? have to be kidding. I want to talk about race. <laughs> yes, because I don't want to talk about the other thing. Right. That That's really what this is about is it's a deflection tactic. They blow woke smoke to deflect accountability and to deflect the topic from what they would rather not be discussing. I mean, even in the education debate, math is racist, as opposed to talking about their failure to teach black and other white kids and brown kids too how to do math in our schools anymore. The military, oh, well, we have Mark Milley railing about white rage, when in fact that deflects attention from the fact that we're sending $200 billion of our own money to make good on what appears to be the very bribe that Donald Trump was referring to there that was supposedly Russian disinformation that we now know is absolutely true, that that Hunter Biden laptop was real, containing information about a potential bribe from Ukraine to the Biden family that the Biden family is now potentially responding to by sending $200 billion of U.S. taxpayer resources to Ukraine, sleepwalking our way into potential major new conflict. But no, let's talk about white rage in the military instead. So it's a deflection tactic. It is artificial. The division is made up, but it serves the purposes of people who want to actually effectuate ends that have nothing to do with race. But if we didn't have the allegation of racism in our back pocket, what would they do? They'd have to actually answer the real questions about the tougher topics that they're trying to sweep under the rug. That's exactly what's happening in this country. It's it couldn't be done without a super malleable, compliant a legacy news in yes. their hip pocket. It, you you can't just stand alone and want to talk about race. You have to get CNN and MSNBC and LA Times and New York Times and ABC and Reuters. You have to get everybody to talk about it because you're talking about it. And that's really, when we go back and look at this chapter in our nation's history, that's going to be the real criminal offense. It's not... Mm -hmm. It's not the Democrats. They're trying to get us to fight about this constantly. It's what are the news outlets doing? Why do they why are they expanding this subject? Why do they only report on racial incidents where there's a white cop and a black man and sweep everything else under the rug? They are the ones that, you know, that the, the Democrats are trying to start a fire, but CNN is dumping kerosene on it. Yes, that's exactly right. I, I, I like that analogy because the way I think about it is we have the final burning embers of racism in the United States. Again, I mean, did I say it doesn't exist? No, I just said it's not a top 50 issue right. in the United States of America. But what they're doing is they're worried that those final burning embers of racism might naturally burn themselves out because then what do they have? <laughs> There's, they have no deflection tactic left, so they're dumping kerosene on it instead to turn that into wildfire again in this country. No better way than to foster more anti-black racism in this country than to take something else away from somebody else on the basis of their skin color. Yet that's exactly what they're doing, and they're getting what they pay for. And so I believe that, look, the time has finally come for the United States of America to embrace, once again, embrace colorblind meritocracy. Once we do that, we're more united, but we also can actually talk about the real issues that they'd rather not be talking about from how our money's being spent and squandered 
laundered fraudulently used to enrich politicians in places like Ukraine. I'm going to talk exactly about how we secure a southern border that's the subject of an invasion across our own southern border in this country, when instead we're too busy focusing on protecting an invasion against somebody else's border. Talk about the wave of crime in this country, by the way, killing black Americans, more black Americans than not. And yet I think that that's exactly what we're not talking about in this country because they're using the deflection of woke smoke. It's a trick and we have to see through it. Yeah, meritocracy. Um, that's all this country has. We are built on meritocracy. It doesn't exist in a lot of nations, but that's been the key to our success. And I've been screaming about that for a long time and also affirmative action hires. And I think mm -hmm. most Americans, in terms of affirmative action, they kind of go, okay, but what's, you know, what's wrong with it? Like, what's so bad about it? And what I've been saying is, oh, it makes a difference. I mean, Biden, we don't have a competent vice president because it's affirmative action hire. We have many people in this cabinet are not are not effective because you want full affirmative action versus full meritocracy. That's right. And I think that we got to acknowledge something real here. Let's get this, 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 this do some real talk. True meritocracy. Mentally incompatible. Wait, say you it again. can't have both. Say it right? again. You, we had a Group glitch. Equity. We had a glitch. Repeat that. Sorry. Yeah. So merit, right? True meritocracy, true merit, and group quotas or group equity, they are fundamentally incompatible. Yes. You can't do both those things at the same time. Right? It's just, it doesn't work that way. And so that's what we have to acknowledge and come to terms with. There will never be group equity if we have colorblind meritocracy, just because different people, different human beings have different capacities in different areas. Meritocracy is the system where regardless of what your God-given gifts are, you can achieve the maximum of your God-given potential, right? Nobody, I'm going to take the liberty of saying this, Adam, you don't know, you and I don't know each other well, so tell me if I'm off base on this, but no, nobody should want to see you and me in the NBA, Right. Even if that would contribute to greater group equity in the NBA. I don't think there's a single Indian American, like not one in the entire NBA. And I am OK with that. OK, I'm OK with that. Now, if, if somebody is excellent and you don't have to change the standards for them to be, I'm by all means, get them in there. I think that even how does this where does the rubber hit the road, even in our military? Right. I think that right now, I mean, you're talking about the real woke issue in the military. It is reducing the physical standards for women in combat roles. This is one you're not supposed to talk about in public. It's not in that binder of traditional Republican talking points that you're supposed to talk about right now. But if you want to talk about the truth, that 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 sort of deracializes this, right? Because it's not just about race. It's in any domain. We should not be lowering the physical standards required in order for women to compete or serve in combat roles. You don't have to change the standards, then fine. It can be man, woman, it doesn't matter. Because what you care there is the most meritocratically capable person who on the front lines of a battlefield can drag his fellow soldier off the field to save his life. And I think that that's something we've abandoned in the United States of America. And we have to confront the reality that group equity and meritocracy are fundamentally incompatible. You cannot have both. Pick one. And right all, now, yeah. it's America picked group equity. I pick meritocracy. That's the difference. And even to put a finer point on it, which is 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 sort of well placed as your heart may be when you're talking about affirmative action. At some point, it's not just about uplifting a certain group. You're going to have to punish another group who deserves to be there. It's it's, yes. it's impossible just to go. I'm going to lift one group. I you can go. I want more African Americans on UC campuses. Fine, but there's a finite number of places of people who can go into UCLA, and at some point, you're going to have to start taking Asians and knocking them off. So mm -hmm. that's the real sort of dirty underlying math that you cannot get around when you're talking about affirmative action. 
That's right. That's exactly right. It, it, it's just there's no free lunch here. But I do think that, you know, from for our part, I think we can do better to make sure everyone starts at the same starting line. Right. Kids should not be trapped in the ghetto of a zip code that they're born in. Right. That should not be a prison for those kids. Parents should be able to tell, send those kids to whatever school is the best possible school for them. I think that's the true civil rights issue of our time. And I think that that's really something we're missing is the opportunity to stand for true equality of opportunity that puts us on the right moral foundation to say we are also vehemently against group equity in terms of results. That's where I am in this. Well, that's the real tell for me when it comes to the Democratic Party, which is yeah. where do you come down on school choice? Because you never stop talking about education and you never stop talking about poor black and brown kids slipping between the cracks and falling behind. Yep. So you must be for school choice. And the answer is no. You've now. Absolutely. I mean, you've now no, I'm, I'm, but you've showed your hand <laughs> to me now. You, you, there's a subject you yeah. care deeply about and never stop talking about. And there is a remedy for that, especially the poor black and brown kids. You never stop talking about statistically, this would be hugely impactful and you're against it, obviously because you're mobbed up with the teachers unions, but you've just told me that you care way more about the teachers unions than you do about competition, meritocracy and helping poor brown and black children. It's it's the ultimate bluff to call. And you just look at what happened in Pennsylvania, what, a month or two ago with Josh Shapiro, the Democrat governor, who had made a pledge on school choice, but was browbeaten into submission by the teachers unions who didn't want him to do it. And this is a particularly egregious case, Adam, because it's, it's one thing if you're talking about taking budgets away from public schools, which I do think is actually a good thing. We could talk about that separately. That's my view. But at least that's slightly more controversial. In Pennsylvania's case, they had an extra $100 million sitting around from the sloppy COVID aid packages that went to state. So they had a surplus, extra money just sitting around. And that's why this Democrat governor said, OK, we'll use that to fund an underfunded school choice program. And the teachers union lobby was against even that. So it wasn't that it was taking money away from the public schools, which that reveals the heart of the lie, Right. This was excess money sitting down from, unfortunately, federal government aid that was wasted by foisting it onto these states during COVID. Nonetheless, they had it, right? And this governor said he was going to use it and yet still couldn't use it for school choice. So that's how disastrously broken that is. I want to go the other direction. I favor school choice on steroids. So not just giving parents the ability to move their kids to whatever school is best for them, but also to call the bluff on the dirty little secret that the schools that spend most money per student are also the ones that deliver the poorest results per student. And so my view is we have to starve the bureaucracy in those broken public schools. So let's say New York City, where it's $40,000 per student per year, and then there's a charter school on the outside that might be $15,000 per student per year. If you move them, the parent has the ability to move the kid. That's great. But half the difference, that $25,000 difference they should be able to take half the difference and put it in that kid's account, $12,500. Accumulate that with just basic investment returns. That's a quarter million dollar graduation gift for that kid when he graduates from high school. Tell me which is a better use of money. It's not even close. And yet we're instead feeding the beast of the teacher union created bureaucracies. It is wrong. It's morally wrong. And I think we in the conservative movement need to talk more about that with that level of detail and specificity than just relying on the first part of what I said, which I stand by as well, which is group equity is fundamentally incompatible with merit. Yes. But I also affirmative, affirmatively stand for true equality of opportunity as well. And I think the more we do both of those things, not just gripe and grievance, but actually have solutions for true equality of opportunity, the more successful we're going to be. I think that's why we're on track. I expect to be the nominee. I hope that's the people's choice, not mine. But if I am, I will win this general election in a landslide. And I think that's the formula for how we do it. Not just complain about the other side, but offer an affirmative vision of our own. You're 100 percent correct. And I think the problem is, I mean, traditionally, and I don't know that we're going to have these barriers now or in the future because of all these alternative voices and news outlets and, you know, Tucker Carlson, 
who will be on the show tomorrow and you know, mm. Joe Rogan, all the people, this, they, they, they can't contain it anymore. It used to be, you know, uh, if you if you're William Randolph Hearst and you got all the ink, then whatever the story is, that'll be your story. There'll be nothing getting yep. out anymore. You can't unring this bell. There's too much alternative information. But in the past, it would have went something like this. You would say, I'm for school choice. The Democrat would say, I'm against school choice because it defunds the school and hurts the school. And then someone like my mom would have said, I don't want to hurt the schools and then voted Democrat. And that's about as far as we get with it because the Republican didn't do a good enough job or a convincing enough job explaining what was going on. They just kept it at school choice versus school unions and the Democrats who have the L.A. Times on their side and all the news outlets on their side, when it comes to putting the vote on for this, they vote for that because they can't control the narrative. Right. That's exactly right. And, you know, I think that the fact, though, that you can explain this clearly, I think one of the things that's important is I, I think and I know this sounds, you know, weirdly conspiratorial or whatever, but I do think the legacy media is in on it. Actually. Oh, yeah. And and so and so using the the filter and the format of reducing the reductionist point to you know whichever example you use your mother or your aunt or whoever will be persuaded into it, I think this conversation might be much more persuasive in the other direction than just getting it served by having Randy Weingartner or whoever show up on CNN for right. two minutes. And, and 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 that's a very different opportunity we have right now. Well, let's just serve people truth. Just to serve them the truth, and then let them choose. Let's just. Them, Let's just do a little thought experiment. If you took your argument, as you just described it to me, using New York City school system as an example, and describe that versus the bloated, overloaded, and super ineffective unions, uh, 92% of Americans would agree with you. They, they just would. If you sat every American down in a room and you just spoke for five minutes about your school yeah. choice and then we let Randy Weingartner talk about it, they would all agree with you. But they're not getting their in, they're not getting it from you. They're getting CNN's. They're getting it. But they're getting the New York Times version of you fed to them. And that's why we're where we're at. But it's changing slowly, which is which is I don't I'm not like a fake Pollyanna optimist or anything, but it's just a fact. And, and when there are reasons to be optimistic, I am optimistic. It is a fact that that's slowly changing. I'm encouraged, Adam. I mean, it's why we're actually, frankly, this campaign is succeeding at a scale that, you know, many certainly did not predict is that we're just able to sidestep and circumvent that traditional game. Now, I do also go on those conventional face-offs I did with CNN and NBC yesterday, and I show up with hard facts and we'll spar and have at it. I actually think that is useful when, it's one thing if Randy Weingarten goes on CNN, it's another if I do, right? And I think right. that that's actually useful to that audience, but it's still in a distorted format and, and you know, they, they play the games they play. But I think that this is changing and I think we live in an opportunity where people also are, and this is one of the great services that Trump did for the country, called out and educated the public through example on how disingenuous and dishonest the traditional media is i think people did people always were skeptical of the media but they didn't realize the level of outright lies coming directly from their tvs into their ears through or from the newspapers to their eyes uh, from the traditional media so that distrust now has created i think a population in this country that's at least trained to be more skeptical at a moment where Locked up for a second. Four members are freaking off, but for which kids like me could not exist. Hold on, Vivek. And, and I think that's actually the reality. Repeat the that last sentence. We had a glitch again. Yeah. Sorry. So I, I think that the reality is forums like this exist in a way that makes candidates like me possible. Right. And I think that's a good thing. I actually am genuinely optimistic that we're at least making pro the media is making progress thanks to people like you in the direction of opening up those pipes now it's up for the political establishment to get out of the way and serve up more people if i may say it myself like me that aren't serving up standard scripts and talking points handed down from partisan gods on high but just speaking 
in the truth, trusting the people with the truth, believing that, you know what, you don't have to agree with 100% of what I say to support me, agree with most of what I say, but just uh. that I mean it 100% of the time. That's good enough. And that's what we should expect of our media. It should be what we expect of our political class. And I think that's what people increasingly do expect and want. And so I'm I, I'm cautiously optimistic, actually, Adam, in terms of where we're heading on this. I am as well, but I had a thought, and it's much more philosophical than it is about, you know, putting the military at the border or school choice, or it's not a nuts and bolts thought, but it's kind of a philosophical thought. And I'm curious to get your input on it, which is um, based on a conversation I had driving in here. I was talking to my friend, Dr. Drew. I know you've spoken to him before. Yeah. And I said, I, you know, I live in California, so I'm like in Los Angeles, you know, so I'm, I'm in the belly of the beast. And I can't figure out why so many of our decisions are sort of feelings based, but they're just clearly horrible policy that then leads to more of what we don't want, more crime, more homelessness, more regulation, you know, higher taxes and more people fleeing for Texas and Florida and Nevada. Uh, and I keep saying, you know, sort of why. And then I, I realize, and here comes the sort of philosophical question. Um, the stuff you're talking about fixing and measures that you're talking about implementing are old and sort of boring in terms of people and the way they think. Like you want to talk military, you want to talk infrastructure, you want to talk border. They want to talk electric school buses and LGBT community and windmills and solar and uh, a society that's colorblind and stuff. They have ideas that are sort of exciting to them versus boring. You're talking about working on the same stuff Richard Nixon was working on. That's your dad's guy. We look to the future and, you know, look no further than Obama. Obama said, I, we're going to fundamentally change this country. And I think there's a lot of voters, especially in California that go, I don't want to hear about all your boring tax codes and border policies in Ukraine. I look to the future. I, I, you know, Kamal Harris just talks about electric school buses. All the time because they want to fundamentally change things. Right. They, they don't want to be, they don't want to go down. You know, Obama's a culture warrior. He's not, he's not a politician. Politicians mm -hmm. talk about infrastructure. He talks about equality. Mm -hmm. But then all the policies suck and we get to where we are today. And the question is, is have, are there enough Americans around who can say, I care about the boring stuff that affects me rather than the pie in the sky stuff that sounds cool at cocktail parties, but doesn't affect anyone? You know, I think it's a it's a deep question, Adam. I, I, I think that I um, I'm going to ponder that version of it. There's a parallel account that I'd like to give you maybe as we're wrapping here, maybe we can each ponder and then we'll continue the next time we chat is I think there's something else going on actually. I think that people have a hunger in their heart to believe in something bigger than themselves. Hunger for purpose and meaning, hunger for cause at a time when traditional religion, faith, patriotism, family, hard work even in some measure have disappeared. And so I, uh, this is, I don't mean to sound dark on this. It's not dark at all, actually, but it may, it may sound dark is, I think that it's the equivalent of wearing a religious hair shirt, right? There, there's religious rituals in, in religious cultures from Catholicism to Hinduism to around the world of like flogging yourself or making yourself, like literally the idea of wearing a hair shirt is a religious concept. And I think that it is a substitute for the real thing. Like, I think that's what the climate agenda is about. It's about self-inflicting some kind of pain that substitutes for a deeper void of purpose and meaning. And I think that's really what's going on in the country is we're, if you don't bend the knee to the real thing or pledge allegiance to the real flag, 
you're going to pledge allegiance to a different flag, call it the transgender flag or whatever it is. That's, I think, for me at least, closer to the flame of what's going on, is that it's not just that we're bored. It's it's not, actually. It's that we're addicted to punishment because we feel hungering for a higher purpose, that the traditional things that used to give us that purpose, when those things are gone, I'm going to find it in new things, even if they're harmful to me, like apologism for success or like climatism, which is a new religion that we embrace. And I think maybe a combination of those two things, actually, my, my version of it, and your version of it, Adam, is you have a lot of people who are sheeple that just follow along for the ride. They're bored by it. You know, that's why the acronym is CBDC, Central Bank Digital Currency. Sounds boring. I don't want to hear about it. ESG, you know, WHO, it, it, the three letter acronyms in DC. It's almost designed to sound sophomoric. It's boring for a reason. It's designed to lull you into submission. But I think there's the separate version of it where you're going to bend the knee to something. And so there's something each of us has to look inside the mirror and ask ourselves, what is it inside me that makes me want to bend the knee? And I think that's a lot harder of a question to answer, but probably a lot closer to the flame of what's really going on in our country. But yes, that's exactly it. It's the hair shirt. I, it's the flogging. You know, it's interesting as I was watching you at an event, and uh, I think they did an interview with your wife, who's a surgeon, if I'm not correct. Yeah, she is. And I thought, I think she'd said that she had to perform 11 or 12 surgeries in a day, uh, oftentimes. And I thought, yeah. that is the perfect metaphor, your wife versus Joe Biden's wife. Joe Biden's wife is a pretend doctor. Now, all the media outlets force us to call her Dr. Jill Biden, but she's yeah. essentially a sociologist or she works at a junior college. I mean, she is not the doctor you would want if you had a heart attack on an airplane. Your yeah. wife who actually does surgeries is the real version of her and what CNN would like her to be, but she's, she's not. And I just found it an interesting sort of metaphor that your sort of campaign is to that. It's, it's really the metaphor of your two wives. One is actually trained. One actually serves a purpose. One could actually save your life. And the other f yells at people for not calling her doctor, even though she's not a real physician. <laughs> it's uh it's funny how this works uh my uh my general rule is i'm I'm almost i don't spend a lot of my air time criticizing joe biden uh i just think he's irrelevant i don't think i'm going to be running against him in the general election i think he's a puppet uh he's a hollowed out husk and it's a form of elder abuse that they're putting uh you know this individual through now and i think there's some criminal acts from the past that probably need to be sorted out but i i think uh you know, making fun of Joe and Jill Biden and Kamala Harris, it's too easy and too, it, it can be fun at times, but, you know, in jest. But I think we have to focus on what are we running to? What do we stand for? And, you know, Purva, I, I respect the heck out of her. She gives me my inspiration where, you know, I mean, I'm running for U.S. president, but I come home every day and it's not, you know, it's, 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 not a small detail that when we sit down and tell each other about each other's day, you know, oftentimes what she's doing is far more important on a given day than what I'm doing. And that gives me back my sense of purpose to, you know, she saved a bunch of lives during the day and improved them, comes home and then comes to our campaign events that we go to in a given evening, or she'll fly to Iowa to be there in the evening after doing 12 cases. We push each other to be the best version of ourselves. And I do think that, uh, you know, I think the fact that Apoorva is part of this says a lot about hopefully the example we'll set for the country from the White House. And you know, as I said, our job in this is we're gonna let the people of this country know who we are and what we stand for. If that's what they want, we'll be serving eight years in the White House. And if they, after learning all of that, want somebody else, we're at peace with that too, but we'll be honest at every step. And uh, you know, that's how we're gonna roll in this campaign. Who do you think is gonna run if not Biden and Kamala Harris? <laughs> Um, I don't know, actually. I mean, I think Gavin Newsom clearly wants to. This guy, Prince Skur, seems like he wants to do something. He seems hungry for attention, too. Um, you know, Michelle Obama doesn't seem like she wants to do it, but they might want her to do it. And, you know, it's 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 a machine that decides who it really is. 
uh, I'm focused on what we stand for. It's it's not going to be when I'm if, if and when I'm the nominee, I expect to be I, I don't think it's going to be they're not going to let Biden run against me. They're holding that documents case against Biden, the one that you don't hear about that much one way or another in reserve, the Hunter Biden stuff, then you're going to hear it ramp up. If Joe doesn't get along the way, that's their form of leverage on him. And so, you know, I think the people in the deep state, basically, they want to get Trump out of the way. That's the first thing they're focused on. Once they get him out of the way, then they view their benevolent dictator hat then kicks in to say, okay, well, Joe Biden shouldn't be running for the Democrat Party, and we can't let him run against a guy like Vivek. They'll get him out of the way. And I know that sounds, you know, people say conspiracy theorist or whatever. I just think it's boring reality of what's playing out in plain sight. And, uh, you know, they'll just trot out their next puppet. But it almost doesn't matter who it is. I think that we can't fall into the trap of obsessing over that puppet. We have to be affirmative about what we actually stand for. And that's what I'm trying to st- stay true to in this campaign. So, Adam, I- I'm a. Uh, Loving talking to you. I got to you as, you, as you may know, I got to roll. Um, yeah, I'm sorry. I thought we had you for an hour. We may have gotten our wires crossed, but well, let's do it again. I'm in. I'll, I'm in. I'll it's, give you, you, you uh, let me give you a plug. Vivek, uh, it's spelled V I V E K 2024.com. I follow you. Uh, I love that what you're saying. Um, I'm at the point now where even if I don't agree with every syllable, out of your mouth, the idea that you're passionate and that you're articulate and that you're bringing it is really uh, impressive to me. And I love, I love seeing where this is going. I appreciate that brother. And it's, it'd be weird if we all agreed with a hundred percent of every utterance of each other. I agree with most of what I say. My job is to at least say what I believe a hundred percent of the time. And if, if most of it speaks to you, then yeah, support us. And, and, you know, I think that we'll do our part in leading this country for eight years. So thank you, man. Thanks, Vivek. And I hope you can check in with us uh, periodically. Yeah, I would love that. Count me in. I enjoyed this. Thank Thank you. you. All right. That's Vivek Ramaswamy. And I'm going to be in uh, Honolulu, the Blue Note. That's coming up uh, September 8th, Friday show, then Vegas, uh, September 14th. Go to amcrawl.com for all the live shows. Oh, no, wait. We doing an ending here or are we doing a beginning here? We got, we're going to break. We're going to come back with Clay Travis. Oh. We are going to break. We'll come back with uh, Clay Travis right after this. Well, let me tell you about Simply Safe. Squeezing in one last summer getaway. Before you take off, protect your home with the latest innovation from Simply Safe Home Security 24 7 Live Guard Protection. With fast protect monitoring, Simply Safe agents can deter intruders through your smart alarm wireless camera warning them they're being recorded and that police are on the way that will scare them away voted best home security of 2023 by u.s news and world report these guys are great sponsor because they're a great company they've been around for a long time now and they do it right very ergonomic and no pulling wires and right now my listeners can get 20 percent off any simply safe system when you sign up for Fast Protect Monitoring, it's a huge offer and there's a limited time. So, Simply Safe, two I's in there. Go online to simplysafe.com slash Adam. That is simplysafe.com slash Adam. There's no safe like Simply Safe. And now, Alcoa presents Definitely Not a Jew! On the Adam Carolla Show, Dateline, Cincinnati, Ohio, a 26-year-old woman was arrested for desecrating a place of worship after defecating on the altar of the chapel at Good Samaritan Hospital. Definitely not a Jew. Clay Travis is joining us. You know him from Outkick and that's a new show on Fox, I think I was just watching. Also has a book out, American Playbook, a guide to winning back the country from the Democrats. Wherever you find finer books, it's out as we speak. And of course, the radio show, the Clay Travis and Buck Sexton show. And that's at noon to three Eastern time pretty heavily syndicated radio show so i think you can find it or you can just do what i do listen to the podcast good to see you clay good to see you adam hope everything's going well 
It is. I feel like you've gone from a sort of niche sports guy to pretty much just ubiquitous, just everywhere, all the time, all at once. Uh, I, I, I don't know if that's a good thing or a bad thing. Uh, it might depend on who you ask, but I do feel like I have kind of the ultimate luxury of I can say exactly what I think on any subject under the sun and everyone just kind of has gotten used to the fact that that happens now. And, you know, I'm gone from being able to pick who's going to win between USC and San Jose State to uh, telling you what I thought of the uh, of the debate and who had you know the best performance last week. And, and by the way, I love both of those equally. Right. So uh, I don't really some people say, like, do you want to give up? No. I mean, I know you love the NFL. Uh, I still love to gamble on games. I still love to talk about who I'm gonna, who's gonna win. I just published, I think, my college football opening gambling picks. So uh, I, I feel, uh, I feel fortunate to get to do what I do. Yeah, and it's smart, and I think it's it's a good time for people who have an opinion because um, if you just let the world know, I give my opinions, and that's that. I don't back down. I don't apologize. I don't go up. Uh, Carlos Santana on you yep. or whoever whoever's backing away from it, then um, I always use the analogy, which is uh, Snoop Dogg gets to smoke pot wherever he wants. Yeah. And the reason Snoop Dogg gets to smoke pot wherever he wants is because he established himself as a guy who smokes pot wherever he wants, and no one would say anything to him if he lit up a joint in the White House or in an operating room. But You can do that with your voice as well. And there's been examples, and Clay's now one of those examples, of people go, I don't apologize, I get my opinions, and then you don't really get asked to apologize. Yeah, and also I think people recognize, you probably have had it at some point in your career, I think the boobs and the First Amendment one was for me kind of uh, a moment for people who, who don't know that. If you go through a moment when you are trending and everybody is demanding an apology and you just say, yeah, you know, I'm not going to apologize, they really lose the ability to do anything to you. And and I'm astounded by how many people who won't just go through it and come out on the other side, because once you do, what's the attack, right? I mean, back in the day, you know this because you've done a show for a long time. Howard Stern did that. And it it eventually became a, well, what are you going to do? Like Howard Stern says what he thinks. Now, I think, unfortunately, Howard Stern today would hate Howard Stern 20 years ago or 30 years ago would hate Howard Stern today. And I hope at some point I, I don't devolve into the position where I would hate the version of myself that I've become. But I do think it's important just to own what you believe. Not apologize it. I, I for, apologize for it. I think you've been doing it for decades now. But there's relatively few people who are willing to do that. And, and it always kind of surprises me. Well, the problem with apologizing to the mob is it's literally like paying off the mob. So you go, yeah. you know, you run a nice little pet store on the corner. It'd sure be a shame if uh, the windows broke. So just go ahead and pay the mob guy off. And, and, th- and you think that'll solve your problems. The problem is, is that guy's coming back for multiple payments and he's never going to leave so you have a shot which is punch him in the face right now and he he will go away pay him off they just keep coming back yeah and 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 you i remember one of your comedy uh, events we did in nashville a couple years ago uh your point on it doesn't end either with the crazy And, and i think that's what a lot of people are coming to recognize with joe biden i bet there's people listening to us right now not particularly political but they just kind of got tired of the Trump show. And they said, you know what? I just I want things to go back to normal. And so they voted for Joe Biden in 2020 under this impression of, oh, he's like an old grandpa. We'll get back to what it was like in the 80s and the 90s. And uh, and it just doesn't happen. Right. Because I think you have to stand up to your point and actually be willing to not back down until things are going to get back to normal. And Joe Biden, to me, is an example of incrementalism where he is just going to be run roughshod by the progressive wing of his party. And that's what we've seen happen, right? Like Joe Biden, you can't convince me when he's sitting there with some dude who's dressed up to look like a chick 
and he's sitting across from him, her in the White House. And he's like, you know, it's so important that people be able to cut their dicks off and cut their boobs off. And man, I, I, this is like a basic human right. You can't convince me that he actually believes that. He knows it's bullshit. But I think the reality is he's so far behind the progressive wing of his party that he's not willing to do what an RFK junior would do, which an actual leader would do, and stand up and say, this is BS. They're all chasing the crazy and trying to hope the crazy doesn't turn on them. And that, to me, is the left wing in this country right now. And there's elements of that on the right, too. But I think it's more pronounced on the left. Well, so here's the question, and I, I pose it to Dr. Drew all the time, which is we probably had some thought when Joe Biden was elected of, okay, fine, at least the arguing will stop. You know, yeah. he's set, he's, you know, missed his Uncle Joe, he's right down the middle, and we can, we can, we can, we can get a little peace, finally, some peace. Um, and it's sort of like saying you live in a house where your parents are constantly bickering about something and your dad doesn't want to pay for a new sofa and your mom wants a new sofa. And then at some point, the new sofa arrives and you think as a child, finally, I can go to bed. We have a new sofa. Maybe dad's not happy about it, but the argument has ended and now we're going to live in peace. And then the argument ratcheted up even louder. And then at some point, you think to yourself, do they want the sofa or not want the sofa or is this just an argument so my feeling and what i'm starting to realize from the sort of progressive movement i always note it has the word progress and movement in it so you tell me what part of it says let's just pull over on the rest stop and relax for a little bit it's a it's a progressive movement it's there to i uh, agitate now yeah th they can't come out and state their agenda which is we're all a bunch of fucking maniacs and all we want to do is argue about everything and destroy everything that came before us we have to keep talking about rights we have to keep talking about who's being oppressed we have to keep talking about but the fact that they never stop and they just want to wrestle suggests to me that there is no quelling them there's no okay you can get you can get your way and you you know you brought up transgenders you know hanging out with the joe biden in the white house which is comical but i've been around for a long time and the gay movement was we just want to be treated equally that's all we want we want we want marriage we want gay marriage and then at some point everyone said fine gay marriage now we can turn the page and get on with our lives mom and dad will stop arguing oh no 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 we're moving on and not only moving on but we're going to ratchet it up and the more rights they get the more legislation that's passed to protect them, the more equal they are, the harder they have to argue about nonsensical things. And that that's where we're at now. We're now at the point yeah. with gender and LGBT community, as same as we are with race, which is we do have an even playing field now. Everyone's fine. We can get on with our lives. You guys got to go harder in the paint now over less. It's a, it's a great point. And, and, and I think most of your listeners, and I would, I would say most of my listeners and certainly our readers at OutKick and whatnot, I don't think people care who you sleep with if you're an adult. I, I think the number of people that really care uh, is very, very small. And I think it gets smaller every day. But there's a difference between you have the freedom to live your life as you see fit and I have to acknowledge that your arguments in your life are true. And if I'm not arguing that, I'm a bigot. And let me give you an example. I think it's crazy. I'm a lifelong sports fan. I know you are too. The idea that a fucking dude with a dick can put on a women's bathing suit and go become a women's sports champion is I mean, South Park puts the macho man Randy Savage in this role to ridicule it. Now it's reality. And if you say, wait a minute, you know, like, I don't think a dude should be able to compete in women's sports. Like, there are people on ESPN who will say, you're a bigot. And by the way, most of those people are women who are getting erased. And so my argument would be, Adam, and I'm curious how you would take it. There's an element where we move from, hey, you have the right to live your life to 
where you're demanding that your version of inclusion actually excludes women, right? And so there's not uh, women who decide to become men. This is not a story that way because they're not big, strong, or fast enough to become men's champions. And I would say, for instance, the Bud Light thing, there's no woman who becomes a man and then gets named man of the year. Men, I think, by and large, just kind of feel sorry for women who decide they want to identify as men, but they certainly aren't the apex of masculinity. Whereas women, it seems, are being taken advantage of to me because you have like the Bud Light trans thing where they're legitimately naming a dude who became a woman a year ago a woman of the year, which to me is like the height of uh, erasure of women's athletics. And you're taking away some five-year-old girl who has spent her whole life trying to be a champion, getting up at the early, getting swimming and everything else, suddenly she doesn't get to compete for a championship because a six-foot-four dude decides he wants to put on a women's bathing suit and define himself as a woman. I just I can't believe that we're here, and I think at some point you have to bow up and say, no, this isn't right. To your point, the progressive movement can argue – but it needs to run into a brick wall on some issues. Well, the comedy, sadly, of all the groups that are trying to help the other groups and be advocates for other groups end up hurting the groups. You know, Black Lives Matter. Uh, well, yeah. they, they convince uh, we need to defund the police. Then the police pull back. Now, that's not affecting Whitey and his double gated community. That's affecting the poor black kid in the neighborhood who needs the policing. So the group ends up hurting the group they're trying to help. But what they don't never mention is they're not there to help that group. That's what they, the women's rights or LGBT, you know, community, the transgender, they're not there to help that group. If they were there to help that group, then they wouldn't enact a bunch of policies that hurts that group, which, they, right. which they clearly do. They're using that group as an excuse for them to gain power. That's, that's all, all they do. The, the, the folks that talk the most about the black community do the least for the black community. I'm from L.A. It's nonstop talk about the L.A. USD and the teachers unions and the poor and black, poor and brown black kids. But then they shut all the schools for two years. And guess who really feels the brunt of it? The black and the brown yeah, kids. Wrong, right? They double and triple down on. And I'm a public school kid. I think you were a public school kid. Um, you know, they would have shut me out of school if I were 25 years younger. Um, that would have been my senior year that didn't happen. That would have been my uh, uh, football, basketball, soccer teams that weren't able to play. And that's the, that's the thing that really gets me, Adam. Like if you really – and I write about this a lot in the book. The thing that really troubles me is the only reason we should have politicians is because we are allowing them to make decisions on issues – that the rest of us are super busy on all day long, right? Like, so you got kids, I got kids, they got different uh, events they got to go to, we got different jobs. If we have people that we hire to make decisions who make such awful decisions and yet they continue to get reelected, then we got major issues. And I'll, I'll sum it up this way. It's about to be football season. We treat our high school, college, and pro football coaches to a way more difficult standard in terms of their job performance. We fire them all the time than we do our politicians. 2022, only one incumbent statewide elected official, Adam, got beaten, the governor of Nevada. Every other person, Democrat and Republican, who was running won. And yet I can't tell you how many people I think did the worst job in my life making decisions surrounding COVID. So I'm still super fired up about it. I love that argument. Let me give you one, too. You're in L.A. Uh, did you see the Little League World Series kid hit the home run to walk off uh, from El Segundo? No, I was watching your show the other night. I missed that. <laughs> All right, so thank you for watching that show. So a 12-year-old boy, Little League World Series, El Segundo, California, beat uh, Curacao, I think it was, Kid walks it off, hits a home run into the crowd, uh, L.A. area for people out there who don't know El Segundo. So my point on this, because, Adam, I think sometimes you have to take it out because people get so riled up 
and they're so committed to their team or their camp, what would happen if it came out that the El Segundo team was playing with a 15-year-old in 12U Little League? Everybody would lose their mind, right? right. It would be a scandal. Coach would lose his job. Uh, it, and everybody would acknowledge that this was an outrage. You know, that's why you have to show your birth certificates. I had to take my 12-year-old played in a tournament up in Cooperstown, New York. You have to bring the original birth certificate. They won't even let you bring a copy because they've had so much cheating with kids, different birthdays, everything else. A 15-year-old boy in 12-year-old Little League is nowhere near as much of an advantage as a dude with a dick in uh, in women's swimming. Right? right? And so I think it's just we create everything in sports with the idea of having fair, even playing fields. Everybody overwhelmingly would say you can't take a 15-year-old to 12U baseball. I think anybody who has ever played sports, I think this, Adam, is like a 90-10 issue. And I think the 10, to your point, are starting to get routed. And even worse than getting routed, I think they're getting embarrassed because they're looking and seeing how ridiculous their argument is. What are uh, any predictions? I mean, I said a couple of years ago when they were talking about Biden running for a second term, I said, run for a second term. The guy can barely walk. I don't think it's going to happen. He's he's fallen off. He's you know, when you have a, a mental decline it, it's not something that just sort of happens incrementally yep. over 10 years. The, the first year, you might not notice a change. The second year, it's a little more change. The last year and a half, it goes fast. It, it's, yep. it's emotional decline, mental decline. It's not that different than physical decline. You'll see somebody and you go, how's he doing with that cancer? It's like, he's, he's hanging strong. He's fighting it. Whatever. You catch him the last four months, it's like, oh, my God. It happens fast so i i don't think he's going to be there and whether it's the mental decline and or the whole hunter biden stuff which is as i say to everyone just check their trajectory on hunter biden and joe biden and ukraine and everyone else check the trajectory three years ago we were at this never happened the laptop isn't even real. Then we got to, well, the laptop's real, but the re- there's no connection to Joe. And Hunter was, he was working as a consultant for Burisma. He's allowed to have a job. Then it went to, there's no emails and there's no connection. Just picture the trajectory of that and where we're going to be in 14 months as it pertains to that. Uh, between those two subjects, I don't think there's any Joe Biden. But now what? Biden- I think you're right. I've been arguing it on the show. Buck, my co-host, disagrees. He thinks the pow- he thinks the power of the incumbency is so strong that they'll basically fetterman Biden uh, in the same way they did the Pennsylvania senator. The health won't matter. They line up. They vote for their side. They'll drag him across the finish line or try to. Um, I think it's going to be so bad. And to your point, I would I would also make this analogy: when you raise a kid, the kid from birth to like a year and a half. It's amazing how every day and every week and every month in really young children, it makes a tremendous difference in terms of what they're able to do. The downside of life is that way, too. I I just as bad as Biden is now, he's going to be so much worse at this point in time next year. And God forbid what he would be in 2026 and 2027 and 2028. Um, I think it's going to become impossible. And I think your boy. Gavin Newsom, if I were betting, I think Gavin Newsom is going to end up the Democrat nominee in 24. It's so funny because anyone living in California, Gavin Newsom is like a guy who owns the world's worst Mexican food restaurant, and he's talking about franchising. And we're like, you make the worst Mexican food ever. And he's like, yeah, but I'm bringing it, I'm bringing it to the nation now. And you're like, but you don't understand. Your own restaurant is a cockroach-filled, uh, horrible, horrible mess. And he's like, yep, bringing it to the people. <laughs> like, it's so nonsensical for anyone who lives in California that he would want to franchise his hot mess. And insane, and I've heard a lot of people think it's not doable, but... We are living in a time when we cannot underestimate the stupidity of the American voter and 
and how much it is based on vibes and looks and pablum zero talk about numbers or test scores or the deficit or Ukraine or China eating our lunch. It's all just, I want to give the nation a hug. And the real question is, is can we, will we continue with that? We just got through that. We just got through it with Biden. He said, I'm, I'm uncle Joe and I'm going to give the nation a hug. And we all went fantastic. And now gas is six bucks a gallon in California, but are we going to get fooled with round two of I'm going to give the nation a hug? I think so. Yeah. And, and it's because here's a, here's this is why I think sports is such a good jumping off point. You mentioned earlier, like so much of sports is tribal. And I love this story, Adam. I think you'll enjoy it. Um, I don't remember who the quarterback was at Ohio State, but one of the Ohio State quarterbacks got a DUI. Um, and in the Columbus Dispatch or whatever the main newspaper is in Columbus, Ohio, there was a letter to the editor and it was from an Ohio State Buckeye fan. And he said, you know, the quarterback better play. It actually speaks to how honest Ohio State is that they would even arrest the quarterback because they would never even have a DUI checkpoint in Ann Arbor. Now, that's an ultimate right? Speech, right? Your quarterback gets arrested indisputably for driving drunk DUI. Fan base responds by saying, this is actually a testament to how honest we are at Ohio State because they would never have a DUI checkpoint in Ann Arbor and ever arrest the quarterback in the first point, first place, right? To me, to me, that is where we are with politics, where you will go, and I've seen it for so long, right? Alabama, Auburn. Uh, you know, Ohio State, Michigan, Yankees, Red Sox. You're a member of the tribe. You'll defend anything. I'll give you another story, Adam. And this is what I knew, and I felt bad. My, I knew my son was going to be a diehard sports fan. Ten-year-old son, huge Atlanta Braves fan. Uh, Marcelo Zuna gets arrested, accused of choking his wife. Pretty serious accusation. You know what the first thing my ten-year-old said when he saw the story? He said, Dad, he couldn't have choked her. He has a broken wrist. <laughs> like, reaction as a sports fan, it's sad, right? His reaction as a sports fan is, my favorite player could do no wrong. And every sports fan out there knows because you'll defend your team even when they're in the wrong. And I think that's ultimately what's wrong with politics. It used to be we picked a guy that we thought the other side would potentially like. We were trying to persuade them that our guy was actually a pretty likable guy and he'd do a good job. Now we pick the guy that is going to infuriate the other side the most by and large. Now, to Democrats' credit, they picked a guy in Joe Biden that they thought was the most blandly inoffensive possible candidate. And But then the problem was he ran as an ideologue and now this whole dark Brandon meme is about hey, you're going to hate our guy and you're going to have to deal with it. And that's why I, you know, a part of me thinks 2024, I wish we could just say no Trump, no Biden. Let's pick every, each party has to go back to the drawing board and pick a brand new guy or girl. I think like 80% of the country would be okay with that. Uh, but I think people are so committed to hating the other side that if we end up with a rematch, it's, that's going to be the reason why. Well, let me continue your analogy and tell me what you think. Um, you're always going to want the other teams running back suspended for punching his girlfriend and then make excuses yep. why your guy gets the suit up on Saturday or Sunday um, for punching his girlfriend. Okay, that that I think we can all live with. Uh, it's not a great part of human nature, but no one would ever deny it. And I think as a country, we understood that concept pretty well. What we didn't understand is the announcers and the referees getting involved with the game. And that's what we just were up against. It's a great analogy. I think it is because, yeah, the Steelers hate the Ravens and the Ravens hate the Steelers, so they're going to go battle it out. But we didn't know what the referees were up to. We didn't know CIA, FBI. We didn't know, you know CNN, Twitter. We didn't know Big Tech. was The Big Tech is the referee. 
So Hunter Biden's laptop, that's the, you know, that's the Ravens and saying it does exist. Well, the Ravens say it and says it doesn't exist. Well, that's the Steelers saying it. But now let's ask the referee. Tell us, Twitter, does it exist or not? Nope. Thumbs down. We went, we went in the booth and uh, it doesn't exist. And, the, and we didn't know the refs were bought. That's what just happened to us. I love this analogy. And let me build on it even more, Adam. Because it would not only be that they would suddenly get involved. Think about the way that we treat somebody who's on the take in sports. Like, if you are an announcer and you come on and you're like, well, you know, Deshaun Watson may have raped 30 chicks, but, man, he's a really good quarterback. We should just overlook the 28, you know, sexual assault allegations. By the way, no criminal charges. He paid them off. He got suspended for ever many games for people who don't know. But if you were the announcer who said that, you would lose your job because people who are watching the game would be like, dude, have you totally lost connection with what really matters? Like, this is just a game. You just came on and said, hey, we don't care about the 28 girls at all. I thought this whole story was made up. Like, whoever said that, would never work in sports again. And Adam, if an official was ever shown to have taken money to rig the outcome of a game, that official would go to prison for the rest of his life. We wouldn't stand for it in sports for the announcer to do what I just said, and we certainly wouldn't stand for it for the official. Building on your analogy... We actually, the half of the country that looks at it and says, wait a minute, look what's going on here. Not only do we have to wear it and deal with it, we get called conspiracy theorists for pointing out that it's going on. It's not only that it's going on, it's that for raising it as an issue, the other half says, I don't know what you're talking about. You're crazy. You don't trust science. You're not willing to actually be a reasonable human being. It's not only that they're doing it, it's that they're lecturing us that we're crazy for noticing it. Well, it's it's insane. You have Hillary Clinton going on talk shows on CNN explaining that Trump needs to be locked up for denying the result of an election when that's all she's done for the last five years. A.C. Abrams calling Donald Trump fat in his mugshot. You know, it's <laughs> right? Yeah. And- you don't- other people would say they're fat, you know, and all of the, you know, the usual suspects, the big name guys who were wrong when they signed that declaration, the 51 intelligence guys, oh, yeah. I was like, they're back on CNN that night <laughs> telling rewarded. us what else is going on with Russia. They got rewarded. That's what I'm talking about, about us living in a consequence free universe. That's why I still like sports, because. You could never, like, let's pretend that, uh, let, let, like, who would Joe Biden be if he were a quarterback right now in the NFL? Like, Arch, who would you? Arch Schleister. <laughs> <laughs> I just said that because I wanted to say Arch Schleister. But he got caught in a gambling controversy. I think yeah, Art did. But Maybe but had a problem. Quarterback in the NFL, you would have to say, like, Joe Biden would be like Sam Darnold, right? And yeah. I'm not trying to put Sam Darnold, but if you came out and you were like, Sam Darnold is an incredible quarterback. He is doing a phenomenal job. Every single sports fan would be like, you fucking lost your mind. Sam Darnold is a mediocre quarterback at best. In other words, you can't blatantly lie in sports because other sports fans will call you out. There is a consequence to being wrong in sports. There isn't a consequence for being wrong in politics and or in media, and even worse, as you just pointed out, Adam, all those 51 guys who lied about the Hunter Biden laptop, some of them got jobs in the Biden administration. They still get to go on and be called experts. Like, we live in a consequence-free universe for at least half the country. It doesn't matter what they say, they get rewarded for it. Well, I'll say this about that, and and it's it's a kind of a time we're living in, and and I, you're a good guy to bounce this idea off of, which is um, there's this constant discussion where people go, all right, yeah, 
Well, of course, if you listen to Buck Sexton and Clay Travis, you listen to them, they're going to say, this is the laptop's real. But then if you watch yep. NPR, they're going to say it's not real. And I had a uh, comedian, Orny Adams, was on the show. And he, he did a sort of thing where he went, well, you know, CNN says it's not real. Fox says it is real. Uh, you know, why can't we, you know, kind of have some compromise? And I'm like, well, we're going to say the laptop's half real? <laughs> like, it either exists or it doesn't. Now, I'm sorry, those of you who wish it doesn't exist or wasn't real or the 51 people aren't liars. I, I, I know you wish that. But we're not flipping a coin here, and it's not he said, she said. It exists or it doesn't exist. It happened or it didn't happen. I think you're 100. Look, here's the way that I would put it. And I, you, if you listen to Clay and Buck, you would hear us say this a lot. I really care if I get a fact wrong. All of us get opinions wrong on a daily basis. Like That's what I love about gambling, by the way. You have an opinion. I have an opinion. We put money down on the table. We all watch the game, and then at the end of the game, somebody won, somebody lost, and you or I end up being right as to what we predicted to happen in the game. And it all can happen in the space of a week in football or 24 hours if we're betting on a basketball game, right? I love that. I love the immediate reaction. You put out an argument that you think is going to be true. I put out an argument. We find out what the truth is. We have a mutual friend, uh, Cousin Sal. We did a sports gambling show for four years. I love it. I love that aspect of things. Everybody doesn't get to pick their facts. And on the right, we get criticized all the time. Oh, you believe in misinformation. You believe things that aren't true. I, I mean this honestly. There's a difference between a fact and an opinion. It is a in my like for instance, and take it outside of uh, take it outside of politics and everything else. Water freezes at 32 degrees. I think almost everybody could still agree with that, right? If I came on and I said, I believe water freezes at 33 degrees, you could objectively call me an idiot and say, I can't trust your opinion anymore. And trust me on this. If I, And again, I think sports is such a perfect example. Adam, if I come on to you and I say, you said, hey, who do you think is going to win the Super Bowl? And I say, uh, you know, I think... Uh, Patrick Mahomes, let me start with who's not. I don't think Patrick Mahomes and the Chiefs are going to win the Super Bowl this year. I think Josh Allen's going to get them. I think that, uh, who knows, Deshaun Watson may rise up. Ooh, and I said, and also, I don't think you can trust Patrick Mahomes in the playoffs. The guy's never been to the Super Bowl before. He can't win in the postseason. You, you guys may trust my opinion on, may agree with my opinion that you don't think the chief that the, you agree the Chiefs are not going to win the Super Bowl, but you should trust me less because you know that I shared facts with you that are untrue. When I say we live in a post-truth world, what I mean is a lot of people jump to the conclusion and they don't care at all about the rationale that gets you there. You can agree with my conclusion, but as soon as you know that I am sharing facts that are inaccurate. You should trust me less. And unfortunately, I think everything is so tribal that people go immediately to the conclusion and they don't care at all about the underlying facts that support or don't support an opinion. An opinion, in my mind, is only as good as the factual foundation upon which it is built. As soon as you know that I'm factually inaccurate, you might agree with my opinion, but you should trust me less. Almost no one does that. Well... I'll go I'll go deeper with it. Not only do I find out that maybe your opinions aren't so accurate about Mahomes, but I did see a Buffalo Bills keychain hanging off your set of car keys. And then I go, what is that? And you go, oh, that, oh, you know, they they fund, they give OutKick a very small amount of money every year yeah. just to keep us on, you know, so we're honest. So we honestly report on the Buffalo Bills and we're also honest with the Kansas City Chiefs. And then I notice that your car has a Buffalo Bills bumper sticker on it. And then I realize you're getting a lot of advertising dollars from the Bills. And now I'm like, Oh, I see why he's not accurate. He's not yeah. accurate because because Clay knows a lot about sports. Why Sanjay Gupta's a doctor? 
Why yeah. wouldn't he know about ivermectin? He thinks it's horse paste. Hmm. But he's a physician. How do all these physicians all of a sudden have all these opinions that don't seem to make sense? It doesn't make sense to me. Oh, Big Pharma buys all their advertising on CNN. Well, that's me seeing your Buffalo Bills bumper yeah. sticker and going, oh, you go. We, we, yeah, we get a little money from the Bills, but that doesn't affect our editorial board here. We're all independent. That's what well, we just saw. Ultimately, your audience, my audience, they don't believe that they don't agree with me on everything. Right. I mean, I just like I just wrote this whole book. I mean, there's 300 words in here, uh, 300 pages in here. I don't know, 80,000 words or something. You shouldn't agree with everything. But what you should over time find is, do you trust me to say exactly what I think? Yes. I think most people who listen do. And I trust you, whether I agree or disagree with you to say exactly what you think. I think there is a desperate craving for just authenticity. Yes. And I think it is so rarely served up by the media because to your point, one, most people in media surrounding in general are both dumb and they're cowards. And that's a bad combo. Uh, and, and, and if you're, the more of a coward you are, the less you're willing to say what you actually think because you're so concerned about protecting whatever limited turf you have that you're worried all the time looking over your shoulder about whether somebody's going to come for whatever property, whatever little territory you have. And I just, I, I don't know. I think I'm a little bit weird and it's probably a character flaw on some level. I don't care about anything other than being able to say exactly what I think. And uh, that comes with its own risks, hmm. but ultimately your audience, when they're allowed to be the judge, whether they agree or disagree, they don't, question whether you believe what you're saying uh we need to take a quick break we got a little more to go some news as well clay can you hang out with us for a little bit yeah yeah for sure all right take a quick break back with clay travis right after this simply safe squeezing in one last summer getaway before you take off and have to head back to the office well you're going to want to get some good home security, and some innovation from the good folks at Simply Safe Home Security. 24 7 Live Guard Protection. That's the newest and best they got. With Fast Protect Monitoring, Simply Safe agents can deter intruders through the Smart Alarm Wireless Camera System, and uh, they can uh, send a warning. And let the people that have broken into your home know that they're being recorded and that the police are on the way. That'll send them running. Voted Best Home Security at 2023 by U.S. News and World Report. We all use these guys here because they have such a great system and they're a great sponsor. And right now, my listeners get 20% off any Simply Safe system when you sign up for Fast Protect Monitoring. It's a huge offer. It's a limited time. So go to Simply Safe, two eyes, simplysafe.com slash Adam. That's simplysafe.com slash Adam. Blinds Galore. I just got off the phone with my friends at Blinds Galore a couple hours ago because I'm ordering more blinds from them. They have a huge Labor Day sale. It starts Wednesday, August 30th. All custom blinds, shades, and shutters up to 50% off. You worked hard all summer. Reward yourself with custom window coverings from Blinds Galore during one of their biggest sales of the year. First place to buy custom window treatments online. Trust me, they know what they're doing. I use these guys. We use them here. I use them at home. I use them in my place in Malibu. We use them. Uh, Dr. Drew uses them. Family owned and run, celebrating 25 years in business. Designer quality window coverings without the designer price. So if you've got questions, their expert customer care team, who I was just on the phone with today, will help you through every step of the way, either online or you can do it like I did it right over the phone. It's blinds galore, right, Dawson? You work hard enough. Let Blinds Galore make it easy to get the custom blinds and shades you want in your home. Check out BlindsGalore.com during their huge Labor Day sale and let them know that Adam sent you. That's BlindsGalore.com. Clay Travis is with us. American Playbook, a guide to winning back the country from the Democrats. Wherever you find finer books and, of course, the Clay Travis and Buck Sexton show, I highly recommend it. Uh, and the website, OutKick.com as well. Uh, just a put a button on your last statement, Clay. Um, and I've never really thought about this, but um, I think there's two 
types of human beings and and one is in the vast majority of the other, which is I am much more interested in being accurate than I am in being liked. And now I'm not going to say a bunch of self-serving shit that makes me seem like a hero, but I think historically, uh, micro and macro, I have sat at tables where I was the only person with one opinion and had everybody else hate me at that table, but I was completely fine with it as long as I know I'm accurate, as long as I know I'm correct. And in that particular case, I knew I was correct because I was the only one who knew anything about the subject. So most people, and I think we just lived it with COVID, would much rather be liked than accurate. Uh, my feeling is, is every human being on the planet could hate me as long as I knew I was being accurate <laughs> and correct. I will sleep like a baby and have no thoughts about all those other human beings hating me. That is that is their problem. Sadly, 90% of the populace would rather sit at the table and be wrong and be liked than be accurate and shunned. And it's rare that that wiring pops up, but the guys like you, uh, guys like probably myself, Tucker Carlson, who I'll be speaking to uh, tomorrow on this show, uh, Jordan Peterson, there's a lot more of those. Now, they all seem to be on the right, Trying to think of who sort of represents it in a weird way. Bill Maher is is somewhat somewhat that way on the left. Russell Brand is somewhat you know kind of that way. If you could think sort of left leaning guys, it's rare. Uh, and there's two things you have to have. You have to be wired that way, and you have to be good. Because if you're not good, you're going to get shit canned from ESPN, and that'll be it for you. I think that's a really good theory. I, I, I subscribe to it almost wholeheartedly. Here's another theory that I have. Um, I think if you can make me laugh, I will forgive any flaw or any opinion that you otherwise have. And this is like, I don't know if you, you've ever spent, spent time thinking about this, but um, I, I, I think one of the big flaws that exist today, and you, you, you live in this world, and I think I asked you about it when you came on Clay and Buck, I don't think you can do comedy and be on the left wing in the country in terms of embracing the full progressive movement because it requires a form of uh, totalitarian thought that is the absence of comedy, which requires nuance and also an element of self-awareness, even uh, to be funny in any way. And so one of the things that 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 I, I was thinking about as I was watching uh, the debate on uh, the Republican uh, primary uh, last week. Do you, how many of the guys that are on the stage do you think could come on your show and say something that would make you laugh? Uh, Chris Christie could probably yeah. do something. I, I, I would think uh, Vivek we had on uh, today. Vivek, <laughs> sorry, to, earlier, earlier today. Um, and I think he's a smart enough guy that if he wanted to craft something, you know, I mean, hell, he can rap. He could probably <laughs> spit yeah. out uh, a joke, but it would be in the great minority of people on certainly not Pence. Yeah. And, and, and I think because a commitment to a dogma is the opposite of humor, too. To your point, I think that's why you're I think comedians would probably be overrepresented in the 10 percent because you have to look at the larger culture and recognize how absurd it is and be willing to analyze it. And so I think a lot of those guys and girls who are in the creative industries, they actually agree with us. They are just so focused on the creative industry that they're sort of reflexively claiming that they're left wing, um, when in reality, they just really haven't dove into the specifics to recognize that they aren't actually represented there. Well, Hollywood is basically high school, you know, on steroids. And if you're not in with the cool kids click, you're going to be eating lunch alone with the fat kid. And that is very abundantly obvious to everyone who tries to navigate Hollywood. So they will become in lockstep on whatever the popular subject or idea is du jour immediately and you'll find no diversity. And that's yeah. the part I always find suspicious. So everyone in Hollywood knows that COVID came from a wet market. Everybody. 
no diversity of opinion whatsoever. You guys disagree on everything, but yet you're in lockstep on every one of these subjects, which shows that a large percentage of them are just going along to get along because they're mostly cowards. Not only that, can we discuss the fact that believing that COVID came from a wet market is actually way more racist than believing that it came from a lab and got out. Yes. Right. (laughs) People actually have this conversation, which is more racist. Chinese people are so backwards that they'll eat anything and they have all this disgusting wet market stuff and there's just disease and filth everywhere. And that's where COVID came from. Or Chinese people inside of laboratories are actually very sophisticated and intelligent And they were trying to adjust gain of function research on viruses and they didn't have the appropriate security protocols. Some guy or girl screwed up and it accidentally got out. They said that it was racist to argue that it got out of a Chinese lab where they were doing high level uh, uh, gain of function research. But not racist to say, oh, it's a filthy, dirty, wet market. And that's the way it got out. Like even the arguments for what they were trying to put out there, don't even logically add up if if you were buying into that. Well, they didn't actually think it was racist. They don't really think anything's racist. That just meant they wanted, they they, when they want you to shut up, they call it racist. So you're there trying to figure out what's right and what's wrong. You're not dealing with what's right and what's wrong. You're dealing with people that have an agenda and who realize that the best way to get people to shut up about anything is to call them racist. And that's what just happened. All right, can we, we'll do a little bit of news. We have some, we've curated a few stories, Clay, that you we know okay. you like in advance. Yes, perfect. All right, well, uh, speaking of the Republican debate, so you and I, Adam, we talked about, oh, why like we talk about jennifer anderson like why do we care what jennifer anderson thinks right yes why well we should be asking that about oj simpson maybe because he made a video (laughs) of himself um talking about the republican debate and basically he was talking about our last guest vivek Mm -hmm. and that he thought he was interesting here's a here's a clip this morning i got up and i found myself watching meet the press they had the babic uh on i knew he'd fuck his name up like the um debates the republican debates i said hey this guy is on to something then he'll say something i said oh my god uh, i attribute it to his youth <laughs> and then he recommended that he uh he can sit he's maybe he should pair up with nikki haley maybe vivek should be paired up with nikki haley and, uh, as a running mate that will probably help help him out and uh oj said that he considers himself a libertarian not a republican or a democrat but is it a good thing to have oj saying that he liked you now, well, no one reaches out to OJ for an endorsement. <laughs> right. I think they'd probably rather have Beyonce. Sure. Maybe maybe an Obama or something, an Oprah, but no one's reaching out to OJ. But uh, OJ also said a bunch of stupid shit about January 6th, which was basically he, he sort of drank the Kool-Aid with January 6th as well. Um, I don't know... If he's on doing sort of damage control by, if you think about when you listen to him talk, he attempts to sound like the most regular person on the planet. If you really think about his tone and his aw shucksy kind of ness, like he said, it's almost like what would a murderer not sound like? <laughs> and the answer is this. Do you know what I mean? I mean, I think so he's casual. pulling he's pulling yeah. a Don King on us, Clay. I watched the entire clip, and it wasn't even just talking about Vivek Ramaswamy. He also gave his take on the running back market in the NFL. Yeah. Josh Jake, Saquon Barkley. I'm not going to lie. It's like three minutes, 15 seconds. This is not uncommon for me, by the way. OJ has a, a, a show, you know, has a clip go viral. Other than the double murder. I find OJ to be far more reasonable than the average person in the world of sports. And I actually, myself sitting back, I like his take on Vivek Ramaswamy. I was like, this is not a bad take. And his take on Jacobs and Saquon Barkley was not a bad take. Um, Although I I think you'll love this, Adam. I have a good friend in Vegas uh, and uh, she is out regularly 
around OJ, and this is this is evidently completely true. Girls in their twenties or thirties, OJ is just slaying them. <laughs> wow! Can, can you imagine if your daughter was banging <laughs> Simpson? Like, and 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 I just it, it I we you talked about how dumb people are. They know that OJ is famous, but if you're like twenty five. You don't know that he basically cut his wife's head off like you. And and can you imagine if your daughter like you call your daughter on FaceTime and, you know, she's out in Vegas and like she rolls over and she picks it up and she's in bed with OJ. Like I I just (laughs) he fix left. Right. And I just can't stop thinking about the parents out there. Hey, you know, what are you up to? Oh, I just I just got through fucking OJ Simpson. Like, I mean, like I just I can't even imagine the dad mom reaction. Well, thank you for uh, customizing it so it was something I could think about personally and continue to think about. Um, So let's just do the sort of infamous serial killer math. You know, we all know and lament the fact that we have a culture where Charles Manson got much more potential, potentially could have got much more pussy inside of prison than I could have got on the outside on a construction site when I was 23. That's sad, but that's that's the world. And so we all understand the concept of the infamous killer who is getting marriage proposals from inside his cell room. Yeah. Well, yeah. this is that, but outside of a cell. This is, yeah. what He's if accessible. Charles Manson never did time? <laughs> How much pussy would Manson be slang if he was as infamous and as noteworthy and as, and as you know, ubiquitous, but in a casino? <laughs> He'd be balls deep in someone right now. I mean, here's the other question on OJ that to me is 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 always fun. What if OJ happened now, except like he was a 25 or 26 year old running back? He beats all charges. Does an NFL team sign him? Oh, you know it's it's. I I think we're so weirdly sensitive now to all all subjects that I'm going to go with no. But if he did it now, we'd at least know because there'd be a ring doorbell on every well, single house on the block. But, but I mean, there's a lot of evidence that he did it now. Um, and, you know, like you can point to Ray Rice, whose career ended. But what I'm saying is. Ray Rice's career ended because he averaged 3.4 yards a carry, not because he uh, knocked his fiance out, right? Like if Ray Rice had been running for 2,000 yards a season and, uh, you know, the standard of morality is very much connected to the overall quality of the player, right? Like, and I'll give you an example. If, If Colin Kaepernick had been Aaron Rodgers, like Aaron Rodgers could have taken a knee because he thought ISIS was being unfairly treated right. and he still national anthem. Somebody would have paid him. Right. Like right. it wasn't Colin Kaepernick took a knee. It was that Colin Kaepernick took a knee and most teams are like, ah, eh, he's not good enough. Like OJ at 25 was one of the four or five greatest running backs of all time. Are you telling me that Jerry Jones, after he'd set out of the league for like three years, wouldn't be like, Hey, let's get Simpson on the on the rookie minimum. Like I, I don't know. Yeah, but it, like, sports fans are amoral. Remember, after Ray Rice knocked his fiance out, the Ravens. Everybody forgets this. The Ravens let him show up for training camp, and a bunch of people wore Ray Rice jerseys to the Ravens game to say that they thought he had been unfairly treated. Because again, sports fans, all they care about is winning, and and they'll forget. Or maybe they just want to go home and have uh, dinner waiting for them. You know what I mean? With the Ray Rice jersey guys. That sends a message to your lady that uh, do not get out of your lane, well, sweetheart. Wait. Hey, Adam, women were wearing the Ray Rice jersey. I love it. And hey, remember, the Ravens have a statue up. To, for everybody out there who's like, that's crazy. There's no way that O.J. Simpson would have ever played again. Ray Lewis got charged with double murder, and they have a statue to him up outside of the Baltimore Ravens Stadium. Oh, yeah. He made people to death, too. All right. What else uh, do we got, Chris? Uh, So let's go over to Chicago. So there's been a string of robberies uh, 
car robberies in like 12 hours they've had 30 of them and also muggings and everything like that to the point where a tv news crew in chicago was robbed monday morning while covering it, the string of armed robberies and car sure. um so we would have the footage but they took the camera mm. they took everything um so we we there but uh happened in uh uh, about f- before 5 a.m., black SUV and a gray sedan pulled up. Because, yeah, they're just pulling up in cars. They're running out, usually multiple people, gunpoint. Give me all your stuff. Yeah. And uh, so and the, the, another uh, the, another thing is the mayor, Brandon Johnson, his response is he's suing Kia and Hyundai. Kind of like all the other cities. They're making they're their blaming, cars too easy to steal. Yeah, they're blaming the automakers. Yeah, so we out here have city council ladies who are upset at Toyota for making their catalytic converters too easy to steal welded into the middle of the car at the bottom of the car. But um, I'm curious, Clay, uh, your take on this. Uh, L.A., we got a problem with homelessness. Uh, we got a problem with everything and crime and everything else. And we had an election for mayor and we went more progressive. We didn't yeah. we didn't pump the brakes. Um, we had a chance to get a guy who was basically a Republican running as a Democrat and Rick Caruso definitely would have been a law and order kind of guy, and we did not vote him in. Um, And Chicago just went through the same thing. They had Lori Lightfoot, and instead they went more progressive. Um, I I don't understand what that is. I it it scares it it scares me for the future of the country. That's what I'm saying. Well, I I think what it ties in with is what I'm talking about, like. It's a consequence free universe, right? The whole idea of the marketplace of ideas and democracy in general is you have an opinion. I have an opinion. We'll both battle over who has the better opinion and the better opinion will win. Well, how in the world is anybody saying L.A. is bad? I want more left wing and less uh, competition for those ideas. Same thing in Chicago. Same thing in Washington, D.C. and Philadelphia and all these other New York City to a certain extent. My concern is it's because people are so committed to their team that the consequences don't matter because they're on the right team in the same way that the point earlier we were making, like if a star running back is accused of beating his girlfriend, but he's a good enough player, people will say, you know, oh, well, that that's not that big of a deal. We'll make sure he's on the field. It feels to me like we've reached that world in politics. And and I think partly it's that the media is now also culpable on, on one side in particular. But there are no consequences. The people with the bad ideas are more married to their bad ideas <laughs> because it, it takes more commitment. To be to to yeah. hustle a bad idea, to really to foster a bad <laughs> idea, that's a lot of work. Well, like nobody in sports media, to use my analogy, could make a living arguing that Sam Darnold was the best quarterback in the NFL. Not right. even Sam Agent can right. make that living. But a lot of people go out and argue that people who are objectively doing awful jobs deserve promotions or deserve to keep those jobs. And the one thing I would say that is a little bit different in terms of consequences is I do think a lot of people just said, screw this. And they left California, right? Yes. There are tons of LA residents that live down the street from me now because they finally just got fed up tons of people in orange County. Now those people tend to have the wealth and the resources to be able to do their jobs from different parts of the country. So to go back to the point you started with earlier, the really sad thing is, the people who bear the consequences the most are the people who can't afford to leave, the people who can't afford to go to private school, the people who can't afford to live in a gated community, the people who grow up in some form of poverty. They have to bear the brunt of the policy choices, which make no sense, so the rich people can feel better about themselves in their gated communities. 1,000%. And to keep your sort of Sam Darnold bad quarterback analogy going. I hope he's not a listener. I know he's from a huge Adam Carolla guy. He's like, I got to get away from football. I'm just going to listen to Travis and Carolla talk. And then boom, he just gets wrecked. He's trying to disappear for football. So anyway, I apologize if he's, if for anybody out there who was open not to have to talk about Sam Darnold. 
Well, I'm sure he's- anybody who's made it to the show gets my respect. Um, but I will say this. The time we're living in now is, you know, it's like Kamala Harris is horrible at her job. And maybe just yeah. horrible. She may just be horrible at everything. Um, but she gets fluff pieces written about her by progressive magazines. And I'm saying the difference is, is SI isn't writing pieces on Sam Darnold about he's the best who ever laced up cleats. Yeah. That's the difference of the but time there, that we're living in. There are consequences in sports, right? I mean, that's what's so interesting. Like, you can't argue that an awful team is actually a good team in a barber shop. You'll get laughed out. You can't argue that an awful athlete, like we can debate LeBron versus uh, MJ or Kobe versus, uh, I don't know, uh, Kobe versus Carl Shaq. Malone. Is, yeah, Laker or whatever it is, right? But if I tried to say, hey, you know who I think is the best Laker? Uh, Paige, uh, 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 you know, uh, well, let's think, like Vladi Divac. Most people would be like, "Play, you're you're full of shit." Like, it, there are arguments you could make that are so laughably absurd. Sports fans would not respect you for making them in a serious way. That same thing doesn't happen in politics, and that is scary because politics is so much more significant than sports. Yet, sports requires more factual honesty in its debates than politics does. Well, I was laughing with Dr. Drew about this on the ride in because in politics, our economy is shit. It's going to get shittier. I live in L.A. Gas is five fifty a gallon, and Joe Biden has put his name on it. We're going with Bidenomics on this one. Yeah. Like my yeah. feeling is, is I would want to get my name as far away from what is going on from an economic standpoint in this country and it's all for shit now but he's labeled it he's put his what? name on it which the bill to spend more money and called it the inflation reduction act right like you you couldn't be like hey we just signed um uh, i i don't know uh, we, we just signed uh, uh uh josh rosen to a 200 million dollar contract and we're calling it multiple Super Bowl contracts, right? Like, everybody would be like, fuck imbecile. I'm sorry to pick on Josh Rosen, too. But you can't get $200 million and label the contract a Super Bowl uh, Super Bowl guarantee when there's no evidence whatsoever that that's going to work. Uh, and yet you can do that in politics. All right, one more story. All right, we haven't talked about Trump's mugshot mm. yet. Um, so his campaign spokesperson said that the former president has raised – $7.1 million since the mugshot was released Thursday night after it's booked on 13 felony counts. Uh, yeah, they, they have merch, they have shirts, mugs, everything. Uh, Clay actually on Twitter wrote that the Trump mugshot is now the most famous photo in American history. No hyperbole. What's more famous? Mm. Yeah, it's a good, hard to argue with it, especially with the immediate distribution. <laughs> But people were fired up about this. And I can give you, like, everybody will immediately think, and, and I thought about it before. It's not like this was totally off the cuff. You know, the, the sailor making out in Times Square, um, the, uh, uh, the, uh, the Bush, I think, on the rubble of 9-11 with the megaphone, mm -hmm. uh, the, the Neil Armstrong on the moon. But in terms of historical relevant significance, Hundreds of years from now, the first ever president mugshot is going to be talked about and everyone is going to know it. Not to mention, I got to give him credit here. You don't get multiple takes. Trump nailed that. <laughs> I can't believe I couldn't believe it was real. Like it, it, it really is iconic in a way that that uh, that I didn't anticipate. Yeah, I agree. Um, I think we're turning him into a martyr and messing with something we shouldn't be messing with. And the, the sort of the inflection point we're getting to or the chapter we're in or where we're at as a society now, it sort of seems like there's a bunch of really old atheists who are in charge. And you're saying to them, you don't understand the implications of this. You don't understand what comes next. You don't understand what our children, what their country is going to be. And they're like, I'm, I got one foot in the fucking grave. I don't yeah. give a shit about the Lord. And if the whole shit house burns down in the next 10 minutes, so be it. 
I had my fun. <laughs> I, I I was the guy, you know, Joe Biden's a guy who's been in Disneyland for 15 hours, and I've been in Disneyland for three hours, and he's saying, shut it all down, I got to take a shit, and I'm saying, wait a minute, my kids are here, they want to enjoy these rides, and he's like, I'm done. Like, th- Pelosi, Chuck Schumer, like, all these elderly statespeople, they all just seem like they go, you understand, you arrest this guy, there's going to be a civil war. And they'll go, I'll be watching it from my Barca lounger, drinking my insure, and wait, <laughs> count the days until I die. This is going to be fun. Yeah, I, I, I don't think that's a bad analogy. And I even, I, this morning on Clay and Buck, I said, it remind like, to me, the Democrats are like, you, I'm sure you guys have had a friend who got engaged and you're like, you know, this ends with you getting married, right? Like, right. You, like you've been dating for two years and you're like, yeah, we went ahead and got engaged. I'm like, you don't really like her. You know, like this, this, the process that you have started is you can't just hang out here for political advantage. Like once you file the charges, eventually it leads to trial. And then you, what are you going to do? You're going to put him in prison with secret service agents? Have people even thought through <laughs> the logic of where this goes. And I've I've had buddies before who've gotten engaged after they dated for a while. And I'm like, I, I don't really know that you're taking the logical, like you're, you're trying to make the right decision for right now, but you're not really thinking about what wheels you've put in motion. And that to me is where the Democrats are right now. Cause even when you ask them, you're like, okay, so you you can't let Trump get shivved in the, you know, biscuit line in, uh, in (laughs) prison. Right? Like that, that secret service have to go with him. Like, what is this even? It's like a bad sitcom pitch. Like the president goes to prison and the secret service go with him. I feel. And then he continues to run for president. Like nobody's really thinking this through. Well, I just thought it through and they're going to have to go full El Chapo. Like they have to build him his own prison. And they're going to. What's that? That's not a bad theory. They have to build his own prison, and then it would turn out at some point, somebody from CNN would find out there was a jacuzzi in it, (laughs) and they would go insane, right? (laughs) They would go insane because pictures are going to leak out, and it turns out there's going to be a sauna, and uh, there's going to be jacuzzi, and he'll have an executive chef, and And then everyone everyone at CNN will lose their shit. I'll I'll even take it a step further. They're going to decide that they can't actually put him in prison so he's going to be placed under house arrest, but it's going to be at like Mar-a-Lago or Bedminster. Right. And that's like 99.99% of people live in and they're going to lose their mind. Let me give you a plug, uh, Clay. American Playbook, a guide to winning back the country from the Democrats. That's out as we speak. And of course, the Clay Travis and Buck Sexton show. Very enjoyable. I listen to the podcast version. And uh, you can go to outkick.com for all your sporting related needs clay always good to talk to you my friend keep up the good work you guys do fantastic uh fantastic work i enjoy it i'll see you again soon hopefully thanks clay and you can go to adamcroll.com i'll be in honolulu at the blue note in uh, hawaii coming up september 8th you just go to adamcroll.com for all the shows after that uh, until next time it's adam Kroll for Tr- clay travis and Oh, Vivek. That's right. Not Vivek. 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 Sorry. Vivek Ramaswamy and Chris Maxipata saying mahalo. Mahalo.